I have the uh, honor and privilege to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, every time he comes down, which seems to be at least once a year now when we catch up now, um, every time he comes, I'm like uh, anticipating some sort of mind-blowing story because it always happens. Like when he comes and then when he leaves, there's always something like mind-blowing. Um, last uh, two two years ago when he came, I think he lost his wallet, and so we prayed. And then like right before he left, like he just appeared out of nowhere. That happened. Um, and then this time around, he came and he was talking about how um, this new neighborhood that they were working with, like all these people started getting saved. And my mind, I'm thinking, another one, <laughs> like, and it just keeps happening every year, and so um, I'm just incredibly encouraged by this man's life and what he carries, um, and I think it's really pivotal that we are in this season where we're transforming church. We want to be a multiplying church. We want to be a discipling church, and so I think it's super appropriate that he's here, um, and if you guys didn't come to Minute tonight, you guys really missed out, but the big thing that I took away from that was the triangle that he kept drawing on the board, which is uh, we have an up encounter where we worship and look to God and we have that encounter with him. And then we have an in encounter where we encounter and work things out inwardly. And then we have an outward encounter where we go out. And he kept doing the in, or I'm sorry, the up in and out, up in and out. And it kept reminding me of Illuminati. But um, aside from that, it was great. I'm super encouraged by what he's doing. And so if you guys could uh, give him a warm welcome. And then, yeah, let's see what God has for us. So let's, let's welcome him. God bless you, man. Good morning. Um, I want to thank uh, Pastor Q for allowing me to break bread at his pulpit. I know that it's something that is sacred to all pastors to give up their pulpits. It um, can be nerve-wracking at times. And uh, I want to honor you for allowing me to be here this morning on your 14th year anniversary as a church uh, we're saying, we're believing that God is going to do something great in the house. I got two people that agree with that. Uh, we're believing that God is going to do something great in the house. Yeah. Right? The body of Christ is at a place now um, where we believe that it is time for it to actually move out of its place of immaturity into a place of maturity. Of a place of immaturity to a place of maturity. Now, um, the the best way I could probably say this, I, uh, we we um, I joke around. I have an older brother. He's exactly four years older than me. One day we were in conversation, and um, my mother kind of blurted out that my brother had breastfed until he was four years old. And uh, I have nine siblings, and so the seven of us, well, the remaining six of us um, kind of just attacked him. We just started making fun of him, joking around with him and everything else like that. And, and then I realized I'm exactly four years younger than him. I'm the baby of the family. And I realized like I came along as probably was the cutoff limit for him to say, okay, you got to move. <laughs> it's time for me to eat now. Now, let's be honest. If we saw a four-year-old child breastfeeding, we would think it's weird. Am I the only one? We would think it's weird. If we saw a, a 10-year-old child still breastfeeding, we would think it's weird. If we saw a 15-year-old, 20-year-old child, was not really, he's technically still a child, but he's breastfeeding, we would think it's weird. We would call somebody, right? Um, <laughs> we would probably call the FBI, DEA, and everything else along with it, right? Uh, but, but here's the reality. The church is a 20-year-old church. Churches, people attend churches for 20 years, and they're still breastfeeding. We have people in the church that are filling up pews and seats that have been in there for 20, maybe 30 years, 15 years, and, and still are breastfeeding. I, 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 I am ultra-charismatic, ultra-Pentecostal. Uh, I was, came into the Pentecostal church. I was baptized in the river. Um, we, I've been around revivals, multiple revivals, had a revival that broke out of my Bible college. I love the, the, the power of God. I love the power of the Holy Spirit. I've been around uh, a lot of different charismatic people. And here, here's where we are at the church. We have people that can prophesy detailed information about your life, but can't do a Bible study. 
can see signs, wonders, and miracles, but can't break down a simple devotion to disciple other people. We have learned how to operate in the gifts. We learned how to do the things of God, but have missed the heart of God. We have sought the hands of God and completely missed the target, which was his heart. And so this morning, as, as we're looking back, we're contemplating 14 years of what ministry looks like, what it takes to, to be part of something. And what you that are here right now, you are, are part of a vision, a 14-year vision that probably took maybe two to three years, maybe even more time of prayer and believing God for something. And now you're seated in the revelation of that vision. You're seated in the revelation of that dream. 14 years later, God had set something in order for some of you to come into this house and to be restored, renewed, but also be pushed into a place of maturity. I, I don't find it coincidence that on the 14th year of the anniversary of your church that you're actually commissioning someone to do long-term missions across the sea. I don't find it any way uh, uh, by coincidence that God orchestrated this day that, that a missionary would be birthed out of this house and would be sent somewhere. Uh, listen, church, that, that may happen a lot in Korean churches, but it doesn't happen anywhere else around the world, really. There are, this is probably the first time. I've been serving the Lord for 21 years. This is the first time I've ever seen a church commission a missionary and send them out. House. Out of the house. You are living in something that is supernatural. There's a transition that is happening right now in this very hour. And I'm going to tell you something that usually happens when transition is about to happen. There will always be resistance from the enemy. There will always be a storm that happens to push us back from what God is kind of calling us into. There will always be be resistance. Like, I knew the day that I was going to plant a church, I knew right away the first thing I was going to do was I was going to read every single book on marriage and parenting. Why? Because I knew that the day that I actually planted the church, that there was going to be attack against my marriage and attack against my children. So I prepared myself for that very thing. In case it does happen, I was ready and able and willing to stand in the gap for my marriage and for my children so that we could birth something that we had no idea actually what we are doing other than we would start a church. Now, we're in the, we're in the basis now where, you know, Friday, Friday morning I had coffee with an individual. We met for coffee, and in that process we were talking, and uh, basically she, out of nowhere, just kind of told me she had a mental breakdown two years ago, was in the hospital uh, for seven days, was in the hospital, and um, if you've ever been in a psych ward, it is very difficult to get out. I had a friend of mine uh, who was vice principal of the school. He got into an argument with his wife. He was so mad. He was like, told her, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill myself. And his wife was so mad at him, she called the cops, said, my husband said he was going to kill himself. He ended up getting thrown in the psych ward. He was there for three days, called me up. I don't know how to get out of here. And I'm like, just do whatever they tell you to do. Just stay in line, right? His wife was now repenting because she's like, I was mad at him. I called. I knew he wasn't going to do it. I knew he just said it. He didn't mean it. But I was so mad that I actually called, and now he's in this place. And so I had to actually go on, on his behalf, talk to the chaplain to get him out of there, uh, uh, of, of the psych ward. But I remember he came out. He was traumatized by this. And as the girl was telling me that she had been in the hospital for seven days, I literally said, have you suffered any trauma through that? And she let, just just started bawling down, started breaking down. We were in the coffee shop. She was hiding her face, and, and I was just ministering to the word. She was an unbeliever, never knew about Jesus, never heard the gospel, and I just started sharing the gospel with her, and she got healed, delivered, saved, and now she's part of the family of God. To me, that was confirmation. Okay, God, we need to start thinking about really planting this church in the town that we now live in, and let's see what God wants to do, because my wife is seeing people come to the Lord. Uh, uh, we're seeing, I'm seeing people come to the Lord. People that we, we have this guy that's a, a, it's a weird combination. He's Puerto Rican. His wife's Jewish, raised Jewish. He's Puerto Rican. We met them um, over dinner one time, and now they're, they're starting to be part of our community right now. Uh, and she's out of Jewish faith. She was, she'll look at me like, I didn't even know that was in 
the, the Torah. And I'm like, it's there. It's been there the whole time. I didn't rewrite the book. It's been there the whole time. She's having encounters now with the Holy Spirit and is beginning to tell me about all these dreams that she's having, angelic visitations. And, and I'm like, it's Jesus. Jesus is coming to you. It's like uh, you, you, you have half the truth. The whole truth is the Messiah came. He walked amongst us. He died. He resurrected. He's at the right hand of the Father. And he, and he is now encountering you with this place of his eternal love on your life. And so, listen, we're in a place of preparation. I want you to open up the Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. There is a storm that is coming. And some of you are in the storm. Some of you are about to enter into the storm. And some of you may have just come out of the storm. Mark chapter 4, verse 35, he says, On that day, when the evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. He says, On that day, when the evening had come, you can leave your finger there. He said, On that day, when evening had come, he had said to them, Let us go across to the other side. Understand that there's a storm coming. We have to be prepared and ready for the storm, but the beauty of it is that Jesus automatically tells them, let us go to the other side. That word is really a promise to them that they're going to make it to the other side. Before the storm comes, we have to recognize that there is a promise before the storm. We know that before every single storm that comes against us, there is a promise to us the faithful body of Christ, that we're going to get through the storm. The more and more I look through Revelation, I see that the body is always in a place like Goshen. It is always protected. It is always vibrant. It is always, there are things breaking out on the earth, but the body itself is always going to maintain a living sacrifice. It's always going to be in a place of refuge and safety. There is a promise before the storm. And we need to, to begin to understand that there is a promise before the storm. There's a thing in our psychology that actually messes, messes up. And what it is is what we, what we see and what we hear sometimes controls our behavior. What we see and what we hear controls our behavior. And there's another thing that we learn through uh, social science. It's, it's the reality is that, you know, that only 3% of the room controls the atmosphere of the room. 3% of the room can control the culture of the room. 3%. 3% of the people. So that if we, get three, if we have three people in a room of 10, if we're three Christians in a room of 10 people, we actually have the ability to control the culture of the room and begin to let people see and hear and begin to see their behavior change. Now, not, we're not going for behavior modification. We're going for transformation, regeneration of the heart, people coming into the renewal of God. But understand that wherever you go, you have the ability to transform the atmosphere into his kingdom. God said to them, Jesus said, let's go to the other side. And in that was a promise to them. Then he says, on leaving the crowd, they took with him in the boat just as he was, and the other boats were with him. Now realize, he says, Mark writes this down, and leaving the crowd. Remember, there are times when the promise of God comes with us that it causes a sacrifice that we need to leave the crowd. And leaving the crowd means that you are separating yourself, you are isolating yourself for a time and season. COVID was one of those things that came along and really forced us into isolation. And some of us, the isolation forced us into anxiety, but some of us, it forced us into reading, it forces us into praying, it forces us to begin to build what is really important in our lives, and we got to get rid of some things that were, weren't important any longer. For some of us, the isolation brought, may have brought depression, but for some of us, it was the sustaining joy of the Lord on our lives. Now, I may be one of those weird people in the room that misses that season where the, where the whole world was shut down because in that se season, I was spending an hour every single day in silence. Now, silence is a mastermind killer to sit and to meditate on the scripture 
alone and isolated. But the beauty of it all is when the Lord begins to manifest himself to you and begins to speak to you the things that are about to happen and to prepare you for the storm that is coming. We have been in a season where 33% of the church world no longer attends a church. They do everything online. And some of us are not those out of those 33%. Some of them have left the faith. We hear this word of deconstruction of faith. And let me tell you something. If you've never constructed faith, then you've never, you cannot deconstruct faith. Deconstruction of faith tells me that you have been living in a bubble and not really have been walking with God. You've been hearing the proclamation of God's word, but you haven't begun to be, let it move in your life, move in your spirit. You haven't walked the word out like the, Paul, the Apostle Paul who would say, I bear the marks of Christ. I'm a living epistle. The words have been written upon me because I've walked this truth out. For many of us, it is that place where we hear the word of God, but we do nothing with the word of God. He says they had left the crowd, and as they left the crowd, they had took with him in the boats just as he was on the other boats, and the waves were breaking, and a great windstorm arose. Understand, storms come suddenly, they come severely, and they come surprisingly. A few weeks ago, a week ago from today, I got a phone call of a good friend of mine who committed suicide, married three children. Loved the Lord, was a good man, attended church every single Sunday, was a leader in the church, was a deacon in the church. And all of a sudden I get a phone call to say, did you hear that XYZ committed suicide in his basement? And I reached out to his wife and broken in tears, brokenness on her life, not understanding what is the next move, why God, why God, why God. Listen, storms come in our lives. They don't come without warning. They come surprisingly, they come severely, and they come to destroy you. But understand this one very thing. You've been given a promise of God that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You've been promised by God that he will never leave you nor forsake you. You've been promised by God over and over again that when the storm comes and it comes suddenly and it comes severely and it comes surprisingly that his presence is there with you. Mark begins to keep continuing to write. He says, a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Now imagine this. This isn't any other type of storm. We're talking about a storm that comes down from the mountaintops into the valley where there are right now heading towards the city of Decapolis. They're in that region heading over to the other side is Decapolis. And as they're heading that way through the mountain windstorms that are coming down on the valley and the cool wind that is coming down and the hot wind that is already in the valley, when they come together, they create a storm. Now this storm was probably very strong because we're talking about men. We're talking about Peter, Paul. We're talking about Peter and Andrew and John and James who were already fishermen who were terrified of this storm because, listen, understand something. When, if you have ever been boating before in your life, you will see storms, you will go through storms, but this storm had to have been the perfect storm. This storm had to be so terrifying to them that they knew that in their own ability as sailors, they were not going to be able to get out of the storm. They already had seen the storm and recognized what they saw, what they heard, creates behavioral changes to us. They saw the storm, they heard the storm, they were fishermen, they have sailed through storms, but this storm they knew that whatever they were trying to do before wasn't going to work. And I imagine people around them, I think about Matthew the tax collector, who probably may have never been on the boat before, now is on the boat not knowing what to do. He's probably clinging to the lifeline, praying and praying and praying. He's not sure what, and Peter is running around with buckets of water trying to empty out the boat, and everyone else is looking back to Jesus, and somehow Jesus is in the back of the boat, and he's completely asleep. I don't know if you think about these things. I think about these things all the time. I don't know if you've ever been on a boat, but when you're in the middle of a storm, the boat begins to rock. And th this rocking motion, if you, uh, how many have ever been on a boat? Right? When, when you get off the boat, it, you can't stop, right? You're walking and you're still feeling this. 
right? Like, even though the boat ride is over, you still have your sea legs and you still feel the motion room. So I don't know how it is that Jesus is, is asleep in the midst of the storm. Uh, I, I'm thinking there's wind, there's waves. Jesus is probably getting splashed on. He's probably getting wet, but he's completely asleep. And the reason is because his, his own eyes, his own ears are not being moved by around. His behavior is not being changed by the atmosphere around them, by the environment around them. His entire being is centered on the place that he's in perfect presence with the Father. The disciples forgot one important thing, that they were in this storm, but in this storm, God's presence is in the storm. We have to remember that time that when the storm comes, that God is present with us. He is in the boat. He is in the boat with us. I, I love the small verse that Jesus wept. We, we see in John chapter 11 that, that when we talk to Mary, that it says that, G, that, that, Mary, that Jesus wept. I, I love that verse because what it tells me is this one important thing that Mary, who had just lost her brother Lazarus, is mourning the death of her brother. She is weeping. She is broken. Jesus comes along, and as he's hanging out with her, he doesn't tell her, listen, I'm the resurrection and life. He doesn't give her a theological response. He doesn't give her a biblical promise. He literally sits down, and he weeps with her, even though he knows in a few hours he's going to raise Lazarus. He doesn't tell Mary, I'm going to raise your brother. He gets into the trenches of her storm. He gets into the brokenness that she is feeling. He gets into the pain, the agony, the tears, and he weeps with her. That's the God that you serve today. And I don't know if you recognize that, that in the midst of your storm, that you serve a God who's God not only going to walk with you, he's going to sit down and weep and mourn and lament with you, even though he knows that he has the power and authority to resurrect the very thing that has died inside of you. That's the God you serve. He is an almighty, ever-present God in the midst of all turmoils. To them... They were, he was not responding. They were asking him, Jesus, Jesus, duh, what are you going to do? Like, we're afraid. And, and he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we are perishing? How often have we as a church community said, Jesus, can't you see my brokenness? Can't you see the storm that is around me. Jesus, can't you see that, that all hell is breaking out against me? Where are you, Lord? Where are you in the midst of all this thing? God, I don't see your hand. I don't see your provision. I can't recognize the promise of God. We have all been in those places. Lord, do you not care that I'm, I'm going down? Do you not care that I'm in the storm? And Jesus quickly reminds us today, this morning, that as he woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace. Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Understand this one thing. There's a promise before the storm. God is present in the storm, but there is a power in the storm. What is the power in the storm? We know it to be the Holy Spirit, but we also know there is a transformation power of faith that comes to us in the storm. In a few weeks, on a few Mondays, Memorial Monday, uh, uh, that Monday, Memorial Day of this year, like in the last 15 years, 17 years, uh, they, they, uh, CrossFit, the entire CrossFit community will do this one workout called the Murph. The Murph is a one-mile run, 100 pull-ups, 200, uh, 200 push-ups, and 300 air squats, followed by a one-mile run. They named it Murph after Lieutenant Michael Murphy, who died in Afghanistan, saving the lives of the rest of his community. Um, and so they named it after him. And every single year on Memorial Day, that Monday, uh, every CrossFit gym will do the Murph. And so for the last probably four or five weeks, I imagine every single CrossFit gym on a Monday is programming everyone in their gym to prepare for this one Monday that's going to happen in a couple of weeks. And so they'll do half-mile runs, 
half mile, uh, half mile runs, maybe cut the uh, workout in half a little bit, maybe do, maybe do 50 pull-ups, you know, 100 or whatever, and then you're building this way, you're building this progressive thing until you get to Monday, so they're hoping that everyone can complete it. And understand that CrossFit is kind of uh, uh, set up in a way that anyone can do it, right? You can scale things down. If you can't do 100 pull-ups, then you can do ring rows and stuff like that. Why, why am I telling you about this? It's not about CrossFit. What does CrossFit have to do with Jesus Christ? The reality is this, that we, that God puts us through these storms at times for the purpose of our training in the ministry, for the purpose of our faith increasing, for the purpose of us learning to trust God in a greater measure, for the purpose of us to begin to lead into the Lord and come out of a place of immaturity that every time things go bad, I, I, I'm not a person who believes that the devil is behind everything. I, I'm, I don't go that way. It's just not naturally for me to think like things are bad or happen, the devil's against me. I am not the Apostle Paul. I don't feel like the, the devil's after me. I'm not even on his top ten list, right? Uh, I, I don't think I'm, cov- I'm, I'm, I'm like underneath the radar when it comes to the enemy. I think things come into my life and I see them as a testing of the Lord to say, Lenny, what are you going to do? I see them as an invitation from God. To say, will you step into a season of maturity? Will you step into a season of understanding? I remember one time we were heading to the uh, Amazon jungle. Uh, I, I, I needed, uh, I, I don't know why I didn't think about this the last minute, that uh, I needed a visa to get into the nation of Suriname. I, I forgot totally about what, asking whether I need one or not. Last minute, I, I kind of looked it up and realized I needed a visa to get in. So the only way I could get in, I was leaving the day before, I literally had to drive here from, from Connecticut all the way to D.C. to go to the Suriname Embassy to get a visa uh, that day. So I put in my application that morning. They told me to come back at 3.30 in the afternoon, and I came back. And then, but on the way down, I blew out my tire on the way down. Car was waving everywhere, all over the place. Uh, I almost killed me and my friend uh, Vina Mean, right? We pull over, t- tire is completely blown out. And he looks at me, he goes, Man, what are we, what are we looking at? And I, I was like celebrating. He goes, what are you so happy about? And I'm like, if we almost die just trying to get a visa, just imagine what happens when we get to Suriname. <laughs> Supernatural things are going to break out. Something's going to happen. We got like something God wants to do. You know what happened on that trip? We saw a baby be resurrected from the dead. We saw God really, literally, uh, we took a chief from one of his tribes, came to know Jesus Christ. It was like a Mark chapter 1 experience. We literally baptized him in the river. Had I known there were piranhas in the river, I might have not baptized him in the river. But, but the, I saw the water. I said, let's go for it. We baptized him in the river. And as the chief came out of the river, like it was overcast. The, the, the sun popped over. Like the clouds departed. The sun shone on him. It was like this weird, like what is happening right now? And I said to him, like, commit yourself to the Lord. He says, yes. And then he told the rest of his tribe, everyone here is no longer going to worship deities. We are going to worship Jesus Christ. And one by one, we started baptizing everyone in that village. There are things that are going to happen, but there is a power, a power that comes upon us to give us the supernatural ability to see breakthrough all around us. There is an invitation this morning for you to begin to step into the power and the authority of God, begin to learn to test the Lord, to trust the Lord, and to have a victorious lifestyle as you move forward. Listen, in the presence of the storm, you're going to see things happen. In in the midst of the storm, you're going to see the level of your fear, anxiety go up, but know one thing, that God has given you a promise. And in that promise is his presence. And here's the beauty of of Mark chapter 4. Because if you would le- read one line more into Mark chapter 5, verse 1, you would realize exactly where they were heading. And they were heading to Decapolis, and they were going to have an encounter with a man called Legion. Why did the storm come? The storm came to prevent them from actually coming to the other side. What was the other side? A man called Legion and a, a place where they were sacrificing, worshiping a demonic spirit, and God was about to come, Jesus, 
the man, the living man, was about to come and he was going to eradicate the entire sacrificial system by the drowning of the 500 swine and he was going to heal, deliver, set free this man and then this man who was a Gentile, would go everywhere proclaiming what Jesus did for him. So when that Jesus comes later on and begins to do the feeding of the 5,000 in the city called Decapolis, that we would see that 5,000 Gentiles would come out into the fields to hear the word of God because of the testimony of one individual. Why does the storm come? The storm comes because there is an assignment on your life. There is a mandate on your life to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Why do storms come? To prevent you to have access in what you're going to step into. I get the worship team up here. Teresa, you're going to think this is funny. Two years ago, three years ago now, I was on my way to Nepal, and I usually stop in Turkey as a layover on my way home. And I do it because I like to decompress in Turkey and then come home so when I come back home from a mission trip, I'm not burnt out and my wife gets the best of me and not the worst of me. And so I'm heading back from Nepal 10 days, trekking through the mountains, trekking through the hills, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're seeing the blind see the deaf hear, people encountering God, people have never heard of Jesus Christ before, and I'm on a spiritual high right now. And I fly back into Istanbul, and as I'm making my way back to Istanbul, uh, a friend of mine hits me up and says, listen, there is a, a pastor's meeting that Friday night. I want to invite you to come and speak at that pastor's meeting. And then the Saturday morning, there's a few churches that want you to speak before you leave. And I was thinking, like, I, I just kind of want to come into Istanbul, hang out, eat some falafel, and then kind of head home. I didn't want to do ministry. So the opportunity came, and now I'm preparing myself for this opportunity that just came. And so as I'm flying back home, I land in, in Istanbul, and I'm not sure what happened, but, you know, Trump sent out a tweet to the Turkish prime minister, and then he literally closed the border. So I was stuck in the airport for 24 hours. 24-hour layover inside the airport. Now, it's a nice airport. It's way better than JFK. If you've ever seen JFK, it's probably the worst international airport around. I, I hate flying out of there. So I'm in Turkey. Now I'm trying to get out, and I can't get out. And then some guy says, hey, there's a place you can sleep downstairs in the bottom of the of the airport, you can get a cot and you can sleep. Well, I went down there, it was pretty dark, and I was like, listen, I've slept in some dark areas, but I was like, I'm good. <laughs> I, I'll find some sign somewhere and hide in a corner and pull the sign and just crash out in the corner of the airport. And so uh, I'm here and I'm trying to wonder in God, like, what's going on? We, I, I was just on this spiritual high, expecting, coming from a spiritual high, ready to step into another spiritual high, and now I'm stuck inside the turkey, inside the airport, and what am I going to do? And you can only walk around for so long. You can only sleep in so many floors until you get tired of the entire experience. And finally, I was like, oh, listen, I'll just hang out in the coffee shop. And I break down, I sit down, have a cup of coffee, and the entire time I'm like, what am I going to do, God? Why am I here? And everything else. And I don't, I don't want to tell people I'm American because right now everybody in Turkey hates Americans. And I'm like, man, I, I just don't even want to tell anyone I'm, I'm from America. And I'm trying not to have a conversation with someone. And some guy sits down next to me that's actually from D.C. And I was like, man, what are you doing here? And he's like, I came here on some uh, governmental uh, assignment, whatever. And I, I didn't ask any questions after that. I was like, all right, I'm not asking what you do, who you work for, or anything else. And he says, why are you here? And I said, well, I got, I got stuck here. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I was planning to go to Istanbul today, but uh, they closed the border. Now I'm here. And he goes, well, why were you here originally? He was like, well, I was having another meeting. I was going to have a meeting. And he looked, meeting with who? And I said, with pastors. And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, I was coming to meet with some pastors and encourage them in, in the word and everything else like that. And he's looking at me. He's like, so this is what you do? And I'm like, yeah, basically this is what I do. I come to, I fly out and I tell people about Jesus. And he goes, Man, it's kind of evasive. I'm like, yeah, I guess it is, but, but here's the reality of it. If, if Jesus didn't find me, uh, the person I was before Jesus, you wouldn't be sitting down with me talking coffee with me right now. 
He says, really? I said, yeah, if I had known who you were, I probably would have robbed you by now. <laughs> so you should thank God that Jesus saved me, and now we can have a cup of coffee and talk about things about world politics, geopolitics, and everything else. He goes, I'm a Muslim. And I said, okay, that's cool. What do you know about Jesus? And we had a, a, a one-hour conversation in the Turkish airport about Jesus Christ. And that guy ended up leading, giving himself to the Lord. He le- like, literally was like, I'm ready. And I said, ready for what? I'm ready to receive Jesus. I, I never made that kind of conversation. He kind of just brought it out. And I said, well, this is what we're going to do. Just believe, confess, uh, believe in your heart. Confess me out that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and you shall be saved. And that's what he did that day. And then as, as I was sitting down, a, a, a lady overheard me, an African woman heard me, and she asked me in Spanish, she was from Africa, had moved her family to Spain, and was now in Turkey making her way back home. And in Spanish, she asked me, I've never heard the gospel. Can you explain it to me again? And so I slowly started describing to her the entire gospel message. And she's like, I've never heard that before. And I said, do you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? She goes, yes. But she goes, before I do that, let me get my sons. And she gathered her two boys, and we sat down, and he said, Tell them again, Pastor, one more time exactly what you told me. And I told them really slowly. And I said, do you want to give your lives to Jesus this morning? She said, yes, I want that. And so I led them to the Lord. And for the next four hours, I was sitting in that coffee shop drinking coffee. I never paid for a cup of coffee. Someone kept on bringing me a cup for free. And I just kept on telling people about Jesus for the next four or five hours. And my tank was full. Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that this morning that I could have, gone down negative road. I could have tapped out and said, I don't want to talk to a single soul. I could have slept in that cot in the basement. I could have created, complained, murmured, complained about what God was going to do. But in the midst of that thing, I knew that there was a promise of God on my life. I knew for sure that God wanted me to do something. There was an assignment for me in that place. Listen, some of you are about to enter into the storm. Some of you have already been in the storm or in the midst of the storm. And some of you have come out of the storm. But this morning I want you to walk away with the understanding of why you were in that storm. I want you to come away with the understanding of why you're about to step into that storm. I want you to come away with the understanding of what is God doing? What are you inviting me into this morning, Jesus, as I'm in the storm? So if you're with me this morning, would you stand to your feet? And this is going to be difficult for some of you. To admit to people around you that, hey, I'm in a storm. I know I've been telling you that I've been good, that everything's good. You know, we do the superficial Christian thing. How are you doing today? I'm good. God is good. God is on the throne. And everything's good and everything's great. And meanwhile, the truth is everything's not great. Everything's falling apart. So if you're in this morning, the storm is overwhelming. You're in the storm. You're in it. You're overwhelmed by it. You don't know what to do. And you kind of like feel like as if you're drowning. And you're like, Jesus, where are you in the midst of the storm? If that's you this morning, I want you to come forward right now. The rest of the church, please stand with me. Read out of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling to present you blameless before the presence of his glory and great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Father, I bless this congregation, Lord God. Father, we declare, Lord God, the season, Heavenly Father, of harvest time, God. Harvest time, season, Lord God. We declare that disciples making disciples making disciples to see the planting of churches, to plant churches that plant churches, Lord God. We ask for the mobilization of the body of Christ, Lord God. God, upon this day, Lord God, we believe, Heavenly Father, God, that you rewrite the narrative of Hope Church And as Hope Church moves forward, Lord God, let them be dispensers of hope, God. The hope in glory 
found only in you, Jesus Christ, Lord God. Increase upon increase upon increase. In Jesus' name we pray. And the community of saints said, Amen. Amen. Amen.